Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 43. And we're going to look at verses 15 through the end of the chapter through verse uh, 34. This morning as we kind of continue in, or continue on rather, this, this story, Joseph's story. And I simply called it part 9 in case you weren't uh, following along. You know where we're at, right? We're in part 9 of this. And if you remember from last week, we, we left the, um, the family, so to speak, in, um, in distress a little bit, right? The, the brothers had, had come to, to Jacob, their father, and said, hey, we, you know, we, need some, we need some grain. There's a famine happening. And Jacob wasn't too keen on that idea. He wanted to hold on to, to, to Benjamin, and he didn't want Benjamin to go and get Joseph's request, although they don't know it's Joseph yet. He wanted to see uh, all course, all his siblings, um, but he especially wanted to see Benjamin and, and uh, desired, right? He asked that of the brothers over the first meeting. And so they go back, the famine is carrying on, and, and, and they have this exchange, right, where the brothers tell Jacob, hey, we need to go get some food. And Jacob's response is, well, just go buy a little food. Maybe you can slip under the radar there, right, and, and uh, get some food. And, and they said, no, he won't see us without Benjamin. And there's this, this, this exchange, and I don't know if you've, if you've come from a family that you know, has some siblings and, and uh, has an exchange with a parent, but there's, there's tension, right? There's, there's uh, um, a plan of action that the brothers have that, that dad is a little slow to come around. He doesn't want to, to, to yield Benjamin. He, he's fearful of Benjamin, of losing him, rather. Let me say that. And they have this conversation, and all the brothers get in. We see how they go. It moves to this idea of plural. They're all coming, and they're meeting with, with Jacob. And finally, he, he kind of says, okay, um, if, if it has to be this way, this is, this, it is what it is, right? I mean, that's what he says. If I'm bereaved of my children, if I lose all my children, I lose all my children. And that's kind of where we left this, this story a little bit. And, they, and in 15, we pick up them beginning uh, their journey. And it's, it's kind of, a, of amazing because here really the, the driving factor behind this is it hasn't been, uh, really, I mean, it's God. We know that it's God. God is the hero of, of Joseph's story. He's the hero of the, of the story of his brothers. He's the hero of the story of Jacob. He's our hero as well, but, but they're not really thinking that way. And I think there's a quick identifying mark here where we can say, you know, sometimes in life, um, we're, we're not necessarily thinking what, what God has, right? What does God have for me in this? And we've been talking a lot about, you know, asking different questions because we come to these moments in life and we kind of say, well, you know, this is, this is what's happening and, and I, I, don't, I don't like it or I'm fearful or, you know, where is God and why is God? What is, what is all this about? And we've, we've, you know, we've talked about over and over again how God doesn't, he doesn't owe us a why, right? He's He's sovereign. He's God, right? He has his plan, his purpose. But we, we change our questions, right? Lord, what are you showing me? What are you teaching me? What do you require of me? I mean, that changes our relationship with God. And we, we don't really see that happening yet. Especially in, in Jacob, we probably should have known better the brothers. I mean, if you think of the moments where, where God is mentioned, it's kind of been scarce, right? Uh, throughout this. We see it with, with Joseph, of course. Um, you know, responding to Pharaoh. Yeah, he, he, Pharaoh says, I've got these this dreams, right? Or actually says a dream. And he says, no, it's actually, uh, or it's two dreams, but it's one dream. It's the same thing. But he responds and says, no, I'm not, I'm not the interpreter. God does this. And even when he first meets with his brothers, right, he, he's thinking of, of keeping the nine and sending one home. And he changes his mind after he puts him in, in prison for three days, right? If you remember the story, it's kind of what's happening. And and he kind of says, he, you know, he changes his mind and says, you know what, I'll, I'll send all nine of them home. I'll hold on to one, right? He holds on to Simeon. Um, but he tells the brothers, you know what, do this and live, right? Because I fear God. And there has to be a moment where they kind of go, that should appease a little bit, right? And so the brothers head on their journey, and they find out all the money that they took to buy the grain is, is in their sacks, and, and, and they have this fearful response. What has God done to us? Right? They go home, they share with Jacob. Jacob's response is fear. And, and it's just this amazing kind of emotion. You think of all the emotions that are unfolding in all this. You know, there's, there's, there's Joseph who, who comes to this place after being sold by his brothers. Right? They sold him after they contemplated killing him. Right? They, they sell him. And then he, he, he goes to Egypt and, 
and you know, he, he, he prospers, and then he's lied upon by, by Potiphar's wife, and he's in prison, all these things. And he, he kind of comes to this moment after interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, and God is blessing him. Even Pharaoh acknowledges, who, who do we know? What man is like this who's full of the Spirit of God? Here you have right, Pharaoh acknowledging the Holy Spirit for us. I think that's very interesting. We're going to see something similar in this passage this morning. But, but he, he acknowledges God through all of this, and he has kind of the right perspective. And, but yet there's all these emotions, and he comes to this moment where he, has, he finally has a couple of children, right? And he, he names the first one Manasseh because the Lord has allowed him to forget the affliction of my father's house, the toil, the turmoil. He, he's allowed to, to be free from that. And yet, right, as time goes on, as the story happens, the next thing he knows, right, all his brothers are standing in front of him, save one. And all these emotions. And we kind of come to this idea. And the I, and I, I, reason I just kind of way by, by, you know, setting this intro here for us is, is we identify with that. We identify with, with how we deal with emotions. And, and we want to navigate these things in life where we can see this sovereign hand of God orchestrating and operating. We want to come to know that even in the middle of these things where, where I may feel unsure, I know there is a God who is sovereignly at work. And fear is what we see dominantly in this passage this morning. And as I was looking at this and I was thinking about fear, and, 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 and rightly so, Jacob has this idea, don't send Benjamin, something, <clears throat> something could befell him on the way. And as a parent, we go, yeah, I, you know, I can get that, but he's... He's overly cautious. He's overly fearful. And it, it, made me, it reminded me of the story of the little boy who, who's going to bed one night and there's a thunderstorm outside and the lightning's cracking down. And he asks his mom as, his, as she's tucking him into bed, he says, Mom, can you, you know, nice little quivering voice, can you, can, you, can, you stay, can you sleep with me tonight? After a pause, I'm sure the mom contemplated a little bit. She says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep with Dad. And there's a moment and she hears the quivering voice saying, what a sissy. <laughs> I thought that was good. That's about the best I got. So if you're looking for anything better, right? he's such a sissy, right? Mom's going to sleep with dad. Um, so, so here's this idea of fear. And we come to this passage and they're driven by this. And it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to jump out off the page, and they're going to say they were afraid. And we're going to see a turning point in, in the brothers here a little bit, to the point where they come, the passage begins with fear, and it ends with, with joy. And we're going to begin to see how God operates. Even though they're, they're unaware of it, we're going to see how God operates. And for us, we're going to begin to see how does, how does God operate? How does his common grace, how does it... How does he minister to us? How does he bless us? Even though I'm not thinking this way, or maybe I'm, I'm driven by an emotion, how do we begin to trust, you know what, God in the middle of this is sovereign. So we pick up the passage. It begins in verse 15, and this is what's happening. So the men took the present. And remember, Jacob gave him the, the gift, and he said, hey, take Benjamin, take this gift. Maybe, uh, verse 14, may uh, God Almighty give you mercy before the man, meaning Joseph, which they don't know yet, uh, that he may release your brother, and Benjamin, right? And then he says, if I'm bereaved, I am bereaved, right? If I lose all my children, that's just that's what it's going to be. And so 15, they, they begin the journey. They take the present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the house, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man, excuse me, then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought them into Joseph's house. Now the men were, here it is, they were afraid. And he tells us why. Because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, It is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in that we are brought in, so that he may make us, or excuse me, make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves and our donkeys. And when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of his house. And they said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. But it happened when we came uh, to the encampment that we opened our sacks. And there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand. And we brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money 
in our sacks. And here we have, once again, if you think of, of how Pharaoh responded to, this Egyptian responded to, to uh, Joseph, it's interesting here that here we have these wonderful kind words coming from another Egyptian. He said, uh, but he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the, and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the man into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave uh, their donkeys feed. And then they made a pr- uh, the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon. For they heard that, that they would eat bread there. And when Joseph came, and he brought him a, a present which was in their hand into the house, and he bowed down, they, me, and they bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now in his heart, now his heart yearned for his brother as Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and he wept there. Then he washed his face and came out and he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. So they sat, excuse me, so they set him a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews for that was an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him. The firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his, his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took servings of them before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. And so they drank and were merry with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture that's going to show us Lord, how you move, how you operate in our lives in the many and countless times, Lord, that we are unaware of it. So I pray this morning that you would turn our attention to you, that we would learn, Lord, from your word, and that we would grow in our faith and our trust. And I ask that you'd allow me to get out of the way, and that all attention, Lord, be fixed upon you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we have this scene, and they come to this, this, this moment, right, of, of, of returning. They've had this conversation with Jacob. They've kind of finally got the stubborn, their stubborn father, right, to relinquish, Jacob, or relinquish Benjamin, and, and they're on their way, their journey. And, and you can imagine all the thinking through their minds. How is this going to play out? And you know, hopefully Benjamin comes back with us. Hopefully we get Simeon. You know, the best possible case scenario, that's kind of what they're hoping for. But, but what they receive, I, I would imagine, is like, wow, we didn't expect any of this. Right? And as this, this scene unfolds, and we, and we, we interestingly, we go from fear to, to, to Mary. Right? How does that happen? Well, ultimately, God is at work. And it's interesting that here the acknowledgement of God right, comes from an Egyptian. He's the one who says, look, this is, this is who... Who God is, he, you know, peace be with you, don't be afraid, right? He's clearly understanding the tone and the commitment, or excuse me, the conversation that is happening, right? The brothers come and they say, hey, this is the scene. This is what happened, right? And they're almost like, we didn't do it. You know, I didn't do this. That wasn't me. I don't know. Check the other brother. I'm not sure about him, but, you know, I, we didn't do it. And they have this. And he's well aware of how they're communicating. And he just simply gives these, these most profound words. And, and, you know, and, and what we want to learn today is, you know, is how does God's grace Right? How do we see it in our lives? And the first thing I believe for us, every single one of us, is that God's grace calms our fears. Kind of leads into my first point. Right? These verses 15 through 23, we see this fear. They're full of dread. And they think this is a trap, right? They, they kind of come to this moment and they, and they stand before Joseph, most likely where the, the, the place of business was at, and they're outside and they're kind of waiting on him. And, and Joseph, you know, just kind of paints you the scene, sees them and goes, okay. Um, and he notices Benjamin, it tells us, right? He sees them all. And so he tells his steward, go take him to my house and, and prepare a meal. So on the way there, they're thinking, oh, oh this, is, this is getting worse. We came hoping we could just get some grain, get our two brothers, and get out of here, right? That's, 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 the, that's what we want. We know that'll make Dad happy. And all of a sudden, now we're on the way to Joseph's house, and we're going to share a meal with him, right? So their thoughts are just going all over the place. I don't know if you've had that moment in life where you just, you think the worst, and you think it can't get worse than this, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, no, it's, it's ramped up already, 
right? This is worse than, 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 than the, uh, the hopes that we were having just to get grain and get our brothers and get out of here. We don't want to see Joseph, right? There's always that fear in the back of their mind, their guilt. They know they sold them. We don't want to run into any slaves that would just, you know, it'll wreck the mill later. I'll feel some guilt if I see my brother in chains. I mean, I don't know to the extent of what they're feeling, right? But that's what's kind of happening, just to see what's, what's going on. And he, and he says, come to my house. And so they have this, this moment where they think, you know what, before he shows up, let's, let's figure this thing out. Let's talk to the steward. Right? And they share this, this whole, here's, here's what happened. Right? We were just traveling along. We were just riding the road. And we were just going to feed our donkeys. Right? And, and everything, but here's all the money. And the response, I think, is quite profound, especially if you think about it. These two, you know, the Pharaoh acknowledging the Holy Spirit is in Joseph. Who is a man like this? And here, you know, you see this, this other Egyptian responding. And, and what, you, know, you kind of get some insight, right? Joseph has influence on this young man, right? The steward. To some extent, he's got some knowledge. And he, and he simply tells them, right? Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. This is verse 23. Your God and the God of your father. He's got some knowledge and insight about who this sovereign God is, right? Joseph, you had to realize he's starting to piece this thing together. I mean, he's already had a moment where he's seen his brothers and he's just part of the weeping at that first meeting was, was about bitterness and like, I can't believe this is what's happening. But yet he hears those words after he puts them in prison. This is backtracking just a little bit where they finally go, you know what? It's because of the guilt of our brother. This is why this is happening. And Reuben responds and said, I told you, I told you not to hurt the child. But you wouldn't listen, but yet they all own it. And it's that moment where Joseph, he, he has to leave the room and he weaves. And, and here is a different moment where he's looking upon his brother, right? It's a different uh, emotion, very similar, but it's growing. So the steward tells him, peace, right? This God that I've, I'm learning about, right? Who I know of, Joseph is talking about, here's this wonderful God. He's saying, peace be with you. See, God's grace is for us. He calms our fears. Think about in your own life and moments where, where you know, you've struggled through emotion, you've struggled through difficulty, and maybe a brother and sister said, hey, you know what, in this, there's God, God has peace, right? We can know Christ, and there's a peace that transcends our understanding. It's the same peace Jesus gave to his disciples. You can have this peace. Isn't that a wonderful grace of God to come and go, you know, when this world passes away, I know I, I have him because he has me. There's wonderful truths, and we talked a little bit about this last week about trust, right? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct your paths. That's good, isn't it? But here in this scene, are they thinking that way, right? Jacob's hope was, you know what, maybe, right? It's 50-50, this God Almighty God who, who they should know. He should be saying, you know what, he's sovereign. He's got a plan in this, but that's not their thinking. They come to the scene with immense fear, and I think we identify with that. I struggle with this. I'm walking through this, but yet despite us, there's a sovereign God who calms our fears. His grace calms our fears. And we know from this that they're struggling with some guilt, right? We know that they've made some decisions. We know that we've lied to our father, the brothers. We've lied to, to dad about what happened to Joseph. They're, they're suppressing those things, and yet God is bringing it up, isn't he? He's starting to melt some of that away where they're going to have to deal with some of these things. See, God has the bigger picture. God's got a plan. He's going to build a nation in, in Egypt, and we know why. Right? The Egyptians thought it was an abomination to eat with Hebrews. He knew there would be no intermixing, so he's going he's to develop the nation of Israel in the context of Egypt. God's got a huge plan. And all these brothers are thinking about is, how do we get, how do we get Benjamin and Simeon back home with some grain? That's our goal. We're fearful. Let's, 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 you know, now we're going to his house. It's because he wants to make us all slaves. He wants to take our donkeys. Isn't that an interesting statement? He's the second most powerful man on the planet. Yeah, he wants our donkeys. It just shows you how the, where they're thinking. What is controlling their thinking? And how often do we allow fear, right? How often do we allow the, these things in life to gauge our thinking when we should come back? I'm not saying they're not real. I'm not saying difficulties are unreal. I'm not saying troubles. I'm saying in the middle of those things, we should know that there is a sovereign God. And his grace is for you. 
All right, pause for a moment. We talk about grace. You realize that, that God doesn't owe us. He doesn't owe us grace. He doesn't, he doesn't owe us any of this. If God was to, to simply be kind of backtrack and go, when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, and sin came into the world, God could have ended it right there, and he would be just and holy, just, just, to, just, to, wipe, just to kill him, be done with it. He could have. But he allows it to go on, right? And just because there's more people on the planet, what happens? Well, there's more sin. There's more brokenness. There's more tragedy. There's more dysfunctional families. There's more pain. There's more sorrow. And God could, at any moment, just end it all. He could. And the angels, right, around the throne room would continue to sing, you know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They would continue to work. He would be just and right to do that, but he doesn't, does he? He continues to show grace. And we mentioned this verse a little while back where, you know, I like Paul kind of shares it with us. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, he, he poses this idea of God's goodness because God is good. And he poses that as a question for us to deal with. And he says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Do you show contempt for God's goodness this morning? See, think about it. God could come in on this scene with these brothers and, and say a whole lot of different things through this steward, right? Oh, hey, God knows what you've done, and you better make it right. Can you imagine that statement, what would happen to them? That would crush them. But what do we learn about this, this wonderful, sovereign God? He knows exactly what we need. He knows our goodness. So the challenge for us this morning is in, in life's difficulties and the things that, that you walk through. Are you showing contempt for God's goodness? Are you going, you know what, Lord, sh sh show me, help me. Help me to trust you. Help me to follow after you. Well, what do you require of me? Forgive me for, for, for doubting you. Help me to grow in my faith. Because God's grace is for you. He doesn't owe it to us, right? But it's grace. Of course. By mere definition. God's grace goes above and beyond. It's not something we earn or deserve. So we see this, right? And this 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 turning moment, if you will. And as the passage after the brothers hear this, right, it's, they, they kind of go on to these experiences, if you will, and what they enjoy of God's grace. And so my, my, my next point to this is God's grace is, is undeserved. This is verses 18 through 34, the rest of the chapter. And I, you know, I kind of, I chewed on a lot of different words here. I'll be honest with you. Chewed means I think, I thought quite a bit. I chewed on it. Um, and I just wanted to communicate the idea that you know, that God's grace is common. It's common grace. And that God is active in your life, whether, whether you, you know it, whether you think this way or not. God is at work. And some of the wonderful things we see in this passage is, is how God is moving in these brothers' lives. And they've gone from fear to, to Mary at the end of the chapter. But there's no real acknowledgement outside of, hey, God has done this, right? What the steward has shared with them. Now, we can speculate their conversation and questions and all those things later, but right here is this is what's shown us, right? In, in, in Scripture, they know, hey, God has done this. And then we begin to see God move, right, in their lives. And, and you think about it. Walking back through, they've come into this whole thing with fear. It began back on the road, right? It's, it's, a, it's a suppressed uh, guilt that they're dealing with. And, and God does you know, these wonderful things in their life with, you know, with the return of the money. And they, they simply respond saying, uh, you know, what has God done for us? There's fear. They, show, they, they tell their father. And, you know, it goes on and on. And this is where they're at. And yet they come to this moment where this steward says, you know what? It was God. It was God. It was God's grace. And so we begin to see that God's grace, it's just something that, that is happening, whether you know, it's not conditional on us. It's conditional upon God, and He gives it. They have this, this, this moment where they pour themselves out, and we begin to see these things unfold. And we begin to see how God moves in their lives. How is God moving in our lives? Look at this passage where they, they first come and they're reassured about Joseph's money. The steward says what? Hey, God has done this. Don't worry about the money. Even when, when Jacob comes in on the scene, you realize that uh, excuse me, Joseph, when he comes, he doesn't ever ask about the money. right? But they're concerned about it. And the steward says, hey, 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 don't be afraid. This wonderful, fearful, you know, or excuse me, not fearful, this wonderful God is taking your fears. Don't worry about it, right? So we see that. We also see that, that the steward immediately he brings out Simeon. 
right? That was their initial hope. Let's go get Simeon. Let's hold on to Benjamin. You know, let's not lose Benjamin. Let's not make any decisions about Benjamin and pits along the way, right? Let's not do any of that. Uh, let's get the grain. Let's get out of here. I mean, that's kind of where they're thinking. So immediately their fears are taken. God does this. He says, look, here, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he immediately brings the brother out. And they're like, oh, my goodness, this is wonderful. This is, this is okay. Dad will be happy with this, right? He brings Simeon out. And then they go on from there. And then the steward gives them, them water to wash their feet. Food for their donkeys. Okay, they weren't expecting that. It goes on that Joseph arrives. And what is, you know, last time Joseph conversed with him, what was he saying? You guys are spies. He threw them in prison. Right? They, they just know him as, right, the man. Maybe the man of Egypt, right? He'll, he'll, uh, he'll be merciful this time. They show up. They, they don't know what to expect. They're thinking they're going you know, to be slaves. He's going he's to put us all in prison. We're in his house. How is this going to play out? And the next thing you know, their feet are washed. Their donkeys are fed. They've been told peace. It's okay. And then, then Joseph comes and he doesn't ask about the money. He kindly engages them. How are you doing? How is, how is the father right, that you spoke of? Is, is this your other brother? Okay, can you imagine the brothers just standing there going, wait, what? What's happening, right? And there's no response in their part, at least written here, that they go, man, God is good. But God is, God is good. <laughs> and God is moving. So it goes on from there, and this is where we see the interlude, right? Where, where Joseph is overcome, he goes out and he weeps. You see, God is, God is giving him grace too. From, from having his firstborn son who says, you know what, God has allowed me to forget, to having his brothers put in front of him and having to process and deal with all this, and now he gets to see, but it's probably a moment where I'll never see Benjamin again, and here he is, standing in my house, we're looking eye to eye, and he's overcome with emotion. Right? I imagine part of that weeping is, God, you're, over, you're too much for me. This is too good. Right? After all of the, of the background and all the things he's gone through, he's looking at his brothers into his eyes, and he's overcome with emotion. See, God's grace is operating in his life as well. He cleans himself up, he comes back out, and then they have this wonderful feast. As the chapter uh, finishes, we see them that they're enjoying right, each other. And here's the point of all this, and what I'm trying to for us to get at is, you know, they have no idea this is Joseph. I mean, think about that. The whole conversation, the whole meal, they never figure out it's Joseph. How often in your life do you enjoy God's graces and you never stop and go, man, God, you're good. How often in our lives, because we don't necessarily think that way, do we? I came across this quote from uh, Donald uh, Barnhouse, where he says, you are not a believer in Christ, and yet you are still out of hell. That is the grace of God. You are not in hell, but you are on earth in good health and prosperity. That is the common grace of God. The vast majority of those who read these words are living in comfortable homes or apartments. That is common grace. You are not fleeing as refugees, Along the highways of a country desolated by war, this is common grace. You come, to, uh, you come to your home from your job and your child runs to meet you in good health and spirits. This is common grace. You're able to put your hand into your pocket and give the child a quarter or a half dollar or some type of an allowance. It is common grace that you have such abundance. You go into your house and you sit down to a good meal. This is common grace. On the day that you read these words, there are more than a billion and a half members of the human race who will go to sleep without enough to satisfy their hunger. The fact that you have enough is common grace. You do not deserve it. And if you think that you deserve any of it from God beyond the wrath which you have so richly earned, you merely show your ignorance of spiritual principles. See, we don't take assessment. We don't come to this moment and go, my breath, my life is God's good grace to me. The fact that I'm here this morning and we're, we've lifted our voices in worship and praise is God's good grace to us. The fact that we know His Son and we can call out to Him. The fact that I can pray at any time throughout my day. 
I can pause and pray, and I know that the sovereign God who's created everything in this planet has saved my life. He hears me. I have his undivided attention. We don't stop and think about that. And if we do, we don't do it enough. See, the common graces are unfolding in your life all the time, and yet we tend to focus on what? The fear. This is where the brothers are at. All we see is this, God's punishment. Now, God disciplines his children, right? There's things we go through, and it's for our benefit and our growth. But God is a good God, and he shows grace, and many times we just simply miss it. You know, Paul and Mars Hill in Acts chapter 7, he comes to this moment where he sees them, that they're worshiping to these unknown gods, right? And, and he comes and he says, you know, this unknown God that you've, you're talking about, let me proclaim him to you. And this is what he says in Acts 17, 24 through 28. He says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives all life and breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring it is your breath it is your very existence it is your life this is what god has done and when we come to this moment in life where we're stuck and we're maybe we're hunging up on this idea that i have all this stuff in my past we fail to realize that god's grace and his mercy that he's been operating far exceeds whatever i've been experiencing the fact that we are here this morning and we have a voice to worship and praise him we think for a moment on that. Here's this holy and just God who can do anything with his creation at any time because he's sovereign, because he's mighty, because he's powerful. But yet he says, you know what? I want to call you by your name. I want to do a work in your life. I want you to know my son. That's pretty amazing. And Paul, beginning with these guys who have nothing, have no idea, they're just praying to the unknown God. He says, this is who he is. He doesn't dwell in a temple made by hands. He's God. He does it. He's created everything. He gives you life and breath. This is God's gift. We experience His graces every time we breathe. It's undeserved, but God is good. And we begin to think this way, and we, are, we work through our struggles, and, and we come to this moment. This kind of leads to my last point. The last, the last thing here is we should be overwhelmed. God's grace should overwhelm us. It should be overwhelming to us. So you begin to make that list and think about how God has been active in your life. See, unlike the brothers this morning, if you knew Christ as your Savior, you have some knowledge about this God who's in control of your life even right now. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 45, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends his rain on the just and the unjust. God is, is active. He, he, the common graces right, are, are flowing all over the place. And then and Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8, he says, for we are... Uh, excuse me, for when we are still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died. God demonstrates his love for us. Here is God's love in the fullness. It is the cross. God so loved the world, he does what? He goes to action. He sends his son into this world. So you and I are partakers. We can look at our life this morning and we can know that, that God, is, his sovereign plan is unfolding in front of us. And we know that, that, that he loves us. He is the hero of our story. We know that his grace is, we know that he is, he is present. You notice that this word, as Paul says, God demonstrates his love. It's not past tense. It's not he demonstrated. It's present tense. He demonstrates it this morning. His love is for us. We should be overwhelmed by this, that in the context of the difficulties of life, I know there is a sovereign God who has sent his son to die upon a cross that you and I might know him. We might know forgiveness. We might know what it means to know his grace. To be saved, not in part, but in whole. To have a God who holds us. For us, there are no excuses, right? We know that God is true. Psalms 14, 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. 
All that we are, all that we have is from Him. James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. All that we have, all that we are, our very life, our existence. And for us, it is to come and simply acknowledge, you are God. This wonderful gift of salvation is what you have done. In the context of life and the fears and difficulties, God, your grace is with me. Your presence is with me. This grace that you, you pour out lavishly upon each and every one of us, I, I don't earn it or I don't deserve it. I don't come to this place where I can ever think that I can do something to earn my right standing with you. That's, that's futile because if I think that I can work or earn this salvation, it is completely misunderstand the gravity of my sin misunderstand the, the immensity of your holiness because they are separated. And yet the gospel shines so bright that while I was a sinner, while I was yelling out, crucify him, while I was pointing my finger and go, who are you? While I was the one mocking him, dies for me and see we as 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 believers we see that as as one-on-one christ died for me and it is see god has such a bigger purpose doesn't he it's not for you just to know christ i come on sundays yeah i can i can worship him no he wants your life he wants it all on monday he wants it all on tuesday he wants it every moment of every day he wants you who wants to do a work not just in you, but through you. And for us, we have to be overwhelmed, because I don't know about you, it's, we kind of get to this moment where we look and say, Lord, there's, there must be some mistake here. I'm, I'm not worth this price. I'm not worth this. But God says differently, doesn't he? Yes, you are. This is why God's grace should overwhelm us. It should drive us to our knees. God, forgive me. Help me in my belief. Help me in my unbelief. Help me to read in your word. Help me to submit to the authority of your word. Help me to cherish it. May it become precious to me. May I follow after you. And we think like the disciples who, were, who, when they were whipped and scourged for preaching in the name of Jesus, went out rejoicing. This is how it happens because you realize there is a chasm between me and this holy God. And yet he loved me. He sends his son. All the brokenness and all the mess of our lives, the dysfunction, he says, yeah, I want you. And it should overwhelm us. The simplicity of the gospel is simply coming, confessing of our sins. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you as a savior. I want to believe fully on you. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Regenerate me. It's a word we use. Come, make me alive. Let the new birth come. We follow after you. Because you are worth more than anything in this world. Because I understand your grace. Not only does it calm my fears, not only is it active in the middle of my difficulties, I can't earn it. Because I can't earn it, and you freely give it. That's why it's amazing. I just respond and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Let's pray this morning.